A giant radioactive lizard wallowing in irrelevance returned to the big screen to reclaim his title as king of all monsters, and, more importantly, quench his thirst for untapped foreign markets and revenue streams through a nuclear-powered extreme makeover that reimagined him as a brooding, self-assured harbinger of the future in a world precariously perched on the verge of mutually assured self-destruction. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the History of Godzilla 1985. Thank you to 80stees.com for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below and use code TOYGALAXY to get 30% off your order today. 80stees.com started off as the source for t-shirts inspired by all things pop culture from the 1980s, but there's more to the 80s than just the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 70s, the decade that paved the way for the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 90s, the decade that carried on the legacy of the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 2000s, because the 80s isn't just a decade, it's a state of mind. Whether your interests are laser-focused on one thing, say, movies, there's plenty of choices from Jaws to Shaun of the Dead. If your interests bounce around, they've got shirts from cartoons to video games, superheroes to music and wrestling. From Transformers to Dungeons and Dragons, Gollum to Ron Burgundy, Darkwing Duck to Powerpuff Girls, you'll find something you love. Click the link below and use code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order today. Again, that's code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order. Thanks again to 80stees.com. This video is about the movie Godzilla 1985, and we'll touch on some aspects of the greater Godzilla franchise that we think are relevant to this story. But not much, because there is far too much Godzilla stuff to cover in one video. Take heart, this is our entry point, and like Godzilla, we'll keep coming back to cover the other parts over the next 50 years. Godzilla 1985 is a re-edited, localized American version of the 1984 Japanese film produced by Toho simply called Godzilla, but also called The Return of Godzilla. Adapted for the US by New World Pictures, it contains additional footage and characters not found in the original movie, like Raymond Burr reprising his role as Professor Steve Martin, and the franchise debut of Dr. Pepper. The Yahata Maru, a Japanese fishing boat, is lost in a terrible storm 100 miles south of Tokyo. The following day, intrepid journalist Goro Maki finds the vessel adrift, all aboard dead, except for some giant mutant sea lice and Hiroshi Ken Okamura, who saves him from the giant mutant sea lice. Ken tells Maki that the island the Yahata Maru nearly ran aground on was the resting place of Godzilla, who, after 30 years, has returned. Maki attempts to file the story with his newspaper, but the report is squashed. If word about Godzilla gets out, it could cause a global panic. The Japanese government is moving quickly to silence anyone from talking about the incident as they develop a plan to deal with the impending return of Godzilla, the most destructive natural force the world has ever known. But their plans are also squashed when Godzilla destroys a Russian nuclear submarine. The Russians are blaming the Americans, and the two nuclear superpowers begin to posture. Japan is forced to reveal that the Americans are innocent, and that the world must come together to deal with the threat of Godzilla by any means necessary, except nuclear weapons. But how do you stop an indestructible 300-foot-tall radioactive fire-breathing super monster? What could possibly convince him to reconsider the destruction of property, lives, and valuable shoreline real estate? If the world can't find a way to defeat Godzilla, then the world as we know it is doomed. Godzilla got his start in 1954's Godzilla from Japanese movie studio Toho Company, produced by Tomoyuki Tanaka, directed by Ishiru Honda. A film that, on its surface, was about a giant radioactive dinosaur monster awakened from his slumber by hydrogen bomb testing, wreaking havoc on Japan and terrorizing the fishing industry by hogging the supply. He was a menace! A slightly deeper exploration of the themes in the context of the film reveals a warning to all humanity about the dangers of modern military science, pushing the boundaries of what humans know about the natural world and its weaponization motivated by profit and power. A suggestion that there are things we should not know, as we are hilariously unprepared to deal with the responsibility of that knowledge. Despite its similarity to an entire genre of Atomic Age-inspired giant monster films at the time, Godzilla rose above the herd to become a pop culture icon in Japan. It kicked off a series of Godzilla films, television shows, and licensed merchandise produced over subsequent decades that reached beyond Japan into international markets. Godzilla was heavily re-edited and localized for the American audience two years later in 1956 with a new title, Godzilla King of the Monsters. It was shorter than the Japanese version, omitted the bulk of political themes, and featured new footage produced by Jewel Enterprises that starred Raymond Burr as reporter Steve Martin. Not that Steve Martin. Covering the events as if he were always a part of the movie. 
Whatever the Jewel Enterprises version did to alter the message of the original film was inconsequential with respect to what it did for the franchise in the U.S. It succeeded in introducing the character to the American audience, establishing Godzilla as a movie and future television star, and Toho as a legitimate competitor in the U.S. for ticket sales. No pop culture franchise lasts forever. Hey. We'll see, but so far that's an accurate statement. The ones that have lasted the longest history has shown have had to reinvent themselves to stay relevant as the material grows stale and the audience grows old. Godzilla was one of the first of his kind to recognize this at several levels and adapt. By the end of the 1970s, nearly 20 years after it was created, the character and franchise had become banal, repetitive, predictable Saturday morning children's fare. Godzilla was a liability. Many of the people responsible for the original film, the thing that put him on the map in the first place, were gone, deceased, or moved on to other projects. The more time that passed after World War II, the less the fears of the atomic age resonated with viewers. Godzilla was now a children's superhero, clearly an actor in a rubber suit, fighting against other actors in rubber suits in a televised kaiju wrestling federation with all the kayfabe that a six-year-old could indulge in. Toho reached a point where they needed to save themselves from Godzilla, a point where they needed to save Godzilla from themselves. After a few premature attempts were abandoned, original 1954 Godzilla producer Tomoyuki Tanaka told everyone else to get out of the way as he took back the reins of the franchise. In 1979, ahead of the 25th anniversary of 1954's Godzilla, he intended to reach back to the things that made Godzilla so popular in Japan in the first place. The impending doom, the monster as an elemental machine of destruction, the historical relevance. Because, as fate would have it, fears of the nuclear age were dominating the public consciousness after the March 1979 partial meltdown of a reactor at Three Mile Island. Island in Pennsylvania in the United States, not to mention the escalating tensions of the Cold War between global nuclear superpowers US and Russia. What better time for the return of the living, fire-breathing portent of the apocalypse? Giant monsters and science fiction horror were experiencing a bit of a renaissance at the time. Tanaka was emboldened by the success of movies like 1976's King Kong and 1979's Alien. However, a 1980 script called The Resurrection of Godzilla was turned down by Toho due to budget concerns. In 1983, Toho signed off on a second film based in the U.S. led by director Steve Miner. That project was ultimately doomed by its own hubris as Miner insisted on budget-busting stop-motion animation and 3D projection. Tanaka, backed by the support of legions of Godzilla fans, drew a line and began producing a proper sequel to the 1954 film explicitly for the Japanese audience, ignoring everything that came after it up to and including the 1978-1979 American-produced Hanna-Barbera Godzilla cartoon. They would have Godzuki no more. The script was written by Shuichi Nagahara, who included some of the elements introduced in Miner's unproduced 3D film. It was directed by Koji Hashimoto after the director of the 1954 film, Ishiro Honda, declined. Godzilla, or also referred to as The Return of Godzilla, is a full reboot of the franchise that picks up immediately 30 years after the events of the 1954 film. It opened in Japan in December of 1984, bringing in around $14 million against a budget of roughly $6 million, successfully kicking off a new era of Godzilla movies and merchandise in Japan. In 1985, Toho started looking for a studio in the U.S. to pick up the rights to the return of Godzilla to reintroduce the big lizard to one of the most important markets on the planet. Interest was low based on the franchise's prior history in the U.S. Despite Toho's intention to partner with one of the prominent Hollywood studios like MGM or Universal, the best offer was from independent studio New World Pictures, the company that brought you movies like 1978's Star Crash, 1980's Battle Beyond the Stars, and 1984's Children of the Corn. Founded by Roger Corman and his brother Gene in 1970, New World Pictures had established themselves with their prodigious output of films, 18 in 1984 alone. They also had experience adapting Japanese media for the U.S. audience. In 1975, they released title Wave, an adaptation of the Japanese film Japan Sinks from 1973. In 1981, they released Galaxy Express, a re-edit and localization of Toei's animated feature Galaxy Express 999, based on the television series of the same name. In 1984, they released Warriors of the Wind, a re-edit and localization of Hayao Miyazaki's Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. 
All of those adaptations requiring a great deal of rewriting and dubbing, Tidal Wave going a step further with scenes starring Lauren Green as an ambassador to the United Nations added to the film to help bring an American perspective to the narrative. New World tasked Tony Randall with the adaptation of Toho's Godzilla Returns. Under a tight deadline with around $2 million to work with, Randall thought it prudent to lean into the camp that the U.S. audience would already be expecting from the franchise, redub the existing film, and supplement with some additional scenes featuring American actors. Title was changed to Godzilla 1985, the year of release, yes, but also an homage to one of Randall's favorite movies as a kid, another classic monster reintroduction, 1958's futuristic Frankenstein 1970. New World got to work writing a script for the dubbed Japanese dialogue and for the new American segments. When considering who to cast in those scenes, Lorne Green was once again suggested, but they quickly pivoted to Raymond Burr to further connect Godzilla 1985 as a direct sequel to 1956's Godzilla King of the Monsters. Burr agreed to appear in the film, but with a few caveats. One, his shoot time had to be limited to eight hours. Two, no funny business, literally. He would not participate in the new film if it didn't respect and adhere to the serious anti-nuclear war themes of the original. Burr didn't want to be in a comedy or a film that was going to treat the subject matter, the threat of nuclear destruction, as a punchline, a sentiment shared by Warren Kremerly, who played General Goodhue. Director R.J. Kaiser was already working for New World at the time. He was an editor on their 1981 adaptation of Galaxy Express and producer and editor on several other titles. He would be responsible for making sure that, as best as possible, the Japanese and American footage told a coherent story with a consistent tone. Godzilla 1985 took other liberties with the original film, including but not limited to shortening the runtime by 16 minutes, swapping out sound effects, some of the character names are changed, reordering scenes to increase the tension between the Russians and the Americans. Most importantly, to turn up the Cold War era appeal, the Russians are cast in a much darker light. The New World version makes it clear that the Russians intentionally launch a nuclear missile from orbit, while in the original film the Russians try and fail to stop the accidental launch. Two other editions undercut New World's attempt to maintain a somber, solemn tone. The first was the inclusion of a satirical animated short produced by Marv Newland in 1969 called Bambi Meets Godzilla. Produced while he was a student, the 92nd black and white short has been recognized by some as one of the greatest cartoons produced and has been archived by the Academy Film Archive. The short, which depicts a very brief encounter between the title characters, was shown prior to screenings of Godzilla 1985 during its initial run and on subsequent home video releases. It has absolutely nothing Nothing to do with the film itself and likely set the wrong tone for the American audience ahead of what was intended to be a more mature reintroduction of the franchise. Second, New World Pictures partnered with Dr. Pepper to promote the film across media. Dr. Pepper was investing $10 million. One of the requirements for New World was that the name of the product had to be featured in the film and at least one principal character had to be shown drinking it. Director Kaiser solved this problem by staging a Dr. Pepper vending machine at the intersection of two hallways when General Goodhue and Major McDonough are first learning about the sunken Russian sub. Right at the very beginning of the first new American scene produced, center of frame, one point perspective, same same way Kubrick would have shot it. The second placement was much later, as the militaries of the world, the citizens of Japan, and the viewers are on the edge of their seats, hoping that the plan to lure Godzilla away from the city works. Major McDonough takes a big ol' swig from a Dr. Pepper like he's shooting an ad. It breaks the tension in all the wrong ways. As Kaiser put it in a 2021 interview with VantagePointInterviews.com, my biggest mistake in handling the whole Dr. Pepper connection was having Major McDonough take a sip from it in a shot that pans across our American principles. Just the image of the soda can serve to undercut the tension and invite the audience's derision. All the Dr. Pepper references should have been kept to before Burr's character entered the war room. New World Pictures and Dr. Pepper were also trying to make sure the right people, the right demographics, knew about the movie, whether they enjoyed it for the social commentary or just wanted to dunk on the practical visual effects. I was afraid to love you, but now I want more of you. To that end, they produced a music video called I Was Afraid to Love You, love theme from Godzilla 1985 by Jill Elliott. Because the best way to get the most exposure to the tweens and teens in the audience was to get a video on MTV. The song didn't matter. It's not even in the movie. The content of the video didn't matter. It's mostly clips from the movie. The exposure to that audience, the ones who were most likely to go see the movie, was the important part for New World Pictures, for Godzilla, and for Dr. Pepper. 
The Dr. Pepper promotional campaign may have played a role in setting unrealistic expectations for the film. Godzilla drinking from a giant can of Dr. Pepper in the music video and TV commercials and on printed materials certainly served to downplay his role as Mother Nature's instrument of destruction. Instead, depicting him as just one of the guys, using the visual language of the 1960s and 70s movies that Toho was trying so desperately to disassociate from. It suggests that there is no other way for Godzilla to be viewed in the U.S. than through a satiric lens. No matter how serious it gets, we're still all in on the joke that Godzilla is a joke. In Japan, Return of Godzilla was a success, powering six more films through 1995. New World's Godzilla 1985, however, fared worse, barely earning twice its $2 million initial budget. While profitable, it did not reestablish the franchise in the U.S. the way Toho had intended. Other than the Dr. Pepper promotion, there does not appear to have been much, if any, official Godzilla 1985 merchandise presence. Imperial produced some very simple figures among other toys, but they were all branded Godzilla King of the Monsters, hearkening back to the 1956 American film. New World released Godzilla 1985 on home video in 1986. It was New World's most successful release up to that point, earning as much on home sales and rentals as the film itself had at the box office. Anchor Bay Entertainment acquired New World's library in the late 90s, then re-released both Godzilla 1985 and the original Japanese film Return of Godzilla on video again in 1997, ahead of the 1998 reboot of the U.S. version of the franchise. After that, the rights ownership for Godzilla 1985 got murky. Toho technically owned the original film, but it was unclear who had the rights to the adaptation. In 2016, Kraken Releasing released Toho's 1984 The Return of Godzilla on DVD and Blu-ray for the first time ever. Godzilla 1985 was not included. Since then, it's been increasingly more difficult to watch Godzilla 1985, likely because Toho would prefer that you just didn't. Watch the original, Return of Godzilla, instead. Godzilla 1985 is not currently available on any streaming service, but you can watch it online if you know where to look. Let's just say that it has been archived on the internet by a.org. While they are connected at their core, cut from the same cloth, the legacy of the two films within their respective countries immediately diverges. In Japan, Return of Godzilla was a box office success, praised for its visual effects, winning a Japan Academy Award. New World's Godzilla 1985 stopped the reemergence of the franchise in the U.S. before it even started. Roger Ebert called it a bad movie with aspirations of being a good bad movie. Toho's Return of Godzilla reinforced his status as a Japanese national icon, a monster, a villain, a hero, a cautionary tale, a victim of the modern nuclear age, living, dying, being reborn time and time again, a cycle of reinvention, an echo of the shifting tides or the changing seasons, destined to walk the earth forever, indestructible. New World Pictures attempted to import the 30-year-old franchise into the modern era, into the 80s, and re-establish the franchise for a generation that may only know Godzilla as a parody of itself. But Godzilla 1985 ultimately revealed that the best way to kill Godzilla was to make him American. I don't like the way you I don't like the way you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching. Please hit like and subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, if you would like early access to the videos ad-free, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy and let us know in the comments down below if you've seen the Toho Return of Godzilla or New World Pictures Godzilla 1985 or both. Or better yet, let us know what your favorite piece of Godzilla media is. Comics, cartoons, movies, television shows. I'm a big fan of the current chonky Godzilla series. It's got everything I want from Godzilla. Awesome music, Hollow Earth, Mothra Girlfriend, King Kong, Fenway Park and Chonky Godzilla. What else do you need? <laughs> He's thick. <laughs>